Warning. The following podcast is utter nonsense and may cause agoraphobia, kleptomania, insomnia, and oppositional defiance disorder. We are required by law to provide you with this disclaimer for hazardous materials. And welcome back to yet another quarantine edition of Hazardous Materials, last week's comics this week. I'm, of course, in Casey, and with me as always, Gideon Gonzalez. And, uh, well, once again, we do not have new comics for this week. We're doing a special book club series during this time. And our first entrant is going to be Tom King and Gabriel Walta's The Vision, one of my favorite books of the past 10 years. Uh, but before we get to that, we're going to do our regular news segment at the top. So, uh, Casey, hit us with what you found out. Yeah, news. Uh, sadly, of course, he's right. We didn't get any comics. Marvel and most of the uh, uh, publishers decided not to print any comics at all for the 8th, which was just a couple of days ago. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing kind of uh, mixed uh, mixed information on what, what's going to happen in the future, next few weeks, as far as uh, books getting released, books not getting released. Um, and as it's changing from day to day, we're, uh, we're just going to skip on that bit of information. But completely unrelated to that uh first bit of news that we've got uh is gun uh the director for the upcoming uh guardians of the galaxy 3 did actively hint that rocket raccoon's past would be a big portion of the upcoming movie um, this has been speculated towards for a while but it's nice to hear it straight from the horse's mouth that we'll be getting some more rocket backstory maybe lila will show up who knows uh, yeah, right. Um, now, some of you that may have not actually read up on Rocket Raccoon, um, his comic book background does deal with the fact that he's genetically created. And that's kind of what we're looking at in Guardians of the Galaxy with the fact that he's actively some kind of a cyborg. And he's all, he's already dropped the notion as, hey, you know, I was created. I didn't have a choice in this. Uh, but he and several other animals uh, were created to basically watch over this uh, this planet, or I guess an area of a planet, uh, at, that's an asylum uh, for some exceedingly crazy individuals, and these animals deal with them. It is a wild, wild book. Um, that was a Bill Mantlo and Mike Mignola, one of his first major works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I was a big fan of it mm-hmm. uh, so- when it first came out. Uh, Rocket Raccoon had his uh, his otter girlfriend. Yeah, Lila, <laughs> and. Uh, in slightly lighter news for Rocket, actual maybe sadder depending on how you see it. Uh, Gun confirmed, or I guess deconfirmed, that in his time on Earth and during Endgame, Rocket never saw a Raccoon. Very sad. Oh, that would have been awesome. He didn't get to go back to his roots. <laughs> we'll save that for Guardians Three. Yeah, we're saving that for Guardians Three. Now, now this is this little, next bit of little, little news is, I, I guess, relevant only because I've started paying attention to it. Uh, but uh, Steam's tabletop simulator has seen a gigantic surge in popularity of, of it, all the uh, uh, the COVID-19 isolations. Um, I myself am currently enjoying a, a Hero Clicks simulator on it that's been really, really fun. And I'm trying to gather my, my, my peeps, my friends in on this. I get it. I'm not sure if I've quite sucked you into this vortex yet, but so I will. Can you, can you use any piece in it? Like... Do I got to buy packs on it? Because I'm not about that. No, no, you don't have to buy packs. Um, the, it, it's a completely free upgrade. Um, it's called Hero Clicks 2020. And you can find it in the workshop of Tabletop Simulator. And the guy on it is really a hard worker. He's been dumping packs, uh, sets almost on a daily basis. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I casually, it's like, hey, you know, I was putting together a set and I noticed that Marvel Civil War set's not in there. And like two days later, boom, Civil oh, War man. set is available on there. I was super excited about that. So that is, that is impressive. If you're ever curious, maybe want to play a little of clicks, you can definitely do that online and don't have to worry about buying crap loads and sinking <laughs> your money into a new habit. <laughs> um, our next one is uh, the a lot of the news sources have been quoting him as a Rick and Morty writer, but I knew Jeff Loveness from his really good Nova run from a couple years ago that brought Rick Ryder back. And uh, Loveness is going to be writing Ant Man 3. So. I really like his I'm, comic work, and I'm not sure which episodes of Rick and Morty he wrote, but I mean, having that comedy background is pretty good for writing. Yeah, that, that, 
that tells me that Marvel is definitely hedging their bets on keeping the Ant Man movies largely comedy action, and I'm all about that. He's also done some writing for The Onion, so all oh good wow, novels. really? Yeah, that's some yeah. highbrow uh, stuff right there. Yeah, if you're a Nova fan, I highly recommend tracking down. It has run. I think it was only like seven issues. They just did one trade of it, and it's uh, Rick Ryder tam- teamed up with Sam Alexander. Really cool, weird stuff. Oh. I, you know, I, as much as most comic people don't really like change, especially when it comes to their favorite characters, I love Sam. I love good old Black Helmet Sam, and I'm, I'm really sad that they kind of put him on the wayside, largely. Yeah, so, he hasn't much to do lately. No, I, think- I mean, they, uh, they depowered him right before Rick showed up, and even when he did show up. I, just, I think I just got distracted by my friend walking into my room. <laughs> Uh, so I, I was I was a little let down by the whole thing. Um, yeah, I mean it's like okay, cool. Why 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 would you introduce this character just to bash in his helmet and then just take his powers away and then continue to do some throughout the rest of the series? Like, well, oh, no, no, no. in a, in Outlaw recently, I believe he still has his powers, so he think does he got him back by the end of Champions. Yeah. Uh, does he still have the black helmet? Yeah. Uh, what well, what of his dad though? His dad is the original Black Helmet. What happened to him? I didn't I didn't read his book, so I don't know. Uh, uh, well, uh, we still have yet to see a proper Nova uh, in uh, Marvel uh, Marvel U. I mean, aside from of course all the Nova pilots you mm-hmm. see in Friends of Galaxy One, which you know I'm a John C. Riley fan, and I would have totally been uh, a backed up if they actually got ballsy and decided to make him the Nova. What hey, a cool. time to be alive. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, Taika Waititi, he recently did a, uh, a tweet-along live stream of Thor Ragnarok, which had some pretty fun guest appearances from Mark Ruffalo. But also, uh, he dropped maybe a couple of hints that who knows if they're 100% prestigious or not. <laughs> but uh, the best part of it, though, was the fake page from the four he leaked fake maybe it is real who knows where tony stark comes back yeah and, and he, he, he does play up tony stark quite a bit uh and when of stark gets uh the armor on he's like covered in like travel stickers from all the different states and countries and shit <laughs> <laughs> there's a bit where it's like where thor goes doth mineth ieth deceiveth meeth Yes, yeah, it, was like, oh, it was like, yes, I'm back. And by the way, so is Thanos. So we've got to go after him and call ourselves the Avenger Burrers. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're going to bring back all the dead people now. It would it would be the best Iron Man movie. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's that's <laughs> that's a scathing review. I uh, mean, I, honestly, despite my hatred of Iron Man as a character, the movies are pretty good. I, I like the Iron Man excellent. movies. You know what? I'll even go on uh, task as saying that I enjoyed most of Iron Man 2. I, Iron Man 2 is my favorite of the three. I think it's really? really underrated. I think it's a hoot. I think it's a ton of fun. I think Iron Man 3 was the least of the Iron Man-ish because he was in the armor the least amount of time. But at the same time, it was a good uh, character piece on him. Yeah, like the I hated it when the first time I saw it back when it first came out. But I rewatched it recently. I was like, oh, this is actually really good. This is one of the best, like early Mm -hmm. Marvel movies. And I mean, uh, what was it? um, What what do you call that protocol where you released all the the Iron Man suits? The house party protocol. House party protocol. That's like the coolest thing ever. I mean, I was like, I I still go back to that scene and pick out the little armors that no one paid attention to. Like the fact that Silver Centurion is in that set. My favorite Iron Man armor. I was very happy to see it. It was so cool. Uh, and my second favorite armor, which of course no one talks about, is his space armor, the the Gemini set, which mm-hmm. is that that white and gold plated uh, thing. That was an I love that. Um, but yeah, 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 good times, good time. I'm really looking forward to seeing what uh, Jeff Loveness does with Ant Man three. Um, really looking forward to seeing what uh, Taika Waititi does with uh, Thor four, and I want to see some Jane action. Um, mm-hmm. Moving quite along. Uh, there was an article released, and it, it escapes me on who actually posted this, but it was a it was a good opinion piece that li- it's got some good points to make. Is the fact that Disney is still insisting on putting the New Mutants in a theater? They just won't 
budge on putting it in a stream. I mean, they definitely did it for the hundred million dollar picture Artemis Fowl. I mean, they just threw that right into Disney. Yeah, Plus. There you that, go. that that had bomb written all over it. I was you think so? That oh my god, yeah. <laughs> it, it was in that sweet spot of being entirely too late for to build up on hype and being so divorced from the source material that people who would be excited for it would not want to go see it. And on top of the fact, I hadn't heard any hype at all about this thing, which mm, is yeah, I forgot it was happening. It's like a, it's a death like sentence. Yeah. If you don't advertise a film, if you don't hype it, it's going to die. And when everybody's like, "Why did it die?" It's because no one knew it was out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, crap. It's that's kind of what happened to me with Bloodshot. I mean, I heard the they're making Bloodshot, and then all of a sudden it was out. I'm like, really? I had no clue. Um. Apparently, some people say they saw ads like on TNT and stuff like that. But I, I, I inundate myself with media, and I never saw an ad. So, oh yeah, I, 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 I will save my, uh, my, uh, my craptastic for a review for Bloodshot for another day when I actually see it. <laughs> but yeah, um, I, I, a lot of the good points you're making as far as this new mutants thing is the fact that the PG thirteen horror movie has an exceptional. Uh, lucrative turnaround. It's true. I have made the mistake of seeing multiple PG-13 horror movies in theaters and in crowds full of teenagers. So Not I the best movie-going audience. No, uh, that's my understanding, too. So I, I'm thinking that Disney really thinks that they've got a real moneymaker here. And if that does turn out to be a real moneymaker, what do you do with it? Do you make sequels? If yes. you make sequels, is it MCU? There's so many questions. I, I mean, just want to. I just want to see the damn thing. Just let I want to see the damn thing, and I want to see the sequel that I heard about, uh, which involves Warlock. That's super cool. Uh, it involves um, DaCosta's dad and another mutant, Magma. Oh, so I think it was nice. part of that whole uh, Nova Roma story. Where the hell's Karma? Karma is going to be the villain of the second one. How's that? Very mm. Marvel team up. Yeah, but then they say, of course, you know, she joins at the very end. Yeah. And I think that would be a great opportunity. Uh, Marvel could actually get themselves a uh, uh, a, a, a well-known Vietnamese actress. That would yeah. be kind of cool. I mean, instead, of, instead of actually, you know, going American side for the casting, if they actually went to, like, Vietnam and checked out their, uh, uh, their burgeoning uh, movie community and see who's actually, you know, the spotlight over there, that would be a great opportunity. Um. So I'm I'm kind of curious to see what goes for that. Um, New Mutants is still a mystery about what I guess Disney really wants to do with it. Yeah, we will see. And uh, one last thing before we get to our the meat of this episode, uh, Todd McFarlane did an interview recently talking about the state of the comics industry, and uh, he had a couple of interesting points. One that really stood out to me was he does not have the fear of same day digital releases or continuing like regularly planned digital releases through this. And I honestly 100% agree with him because <laughs> I'm feeling what he pointed out, which is that, hey, comic book readers, kind of junkies. And it's really easy to go sober like if there's just absolutely no way to get, get your fix. And I'm kind of feeling that, not having to spend $50 a week on new books. I'm like, oh, this is kind of nice. I can read all this stuff that I've been buying for years that I never got around to reading. He also pointed out the fact that all, all the comic publishers and comic stores fears that doing a same day digital uh, releasing of comics uh, did not hinder or harm the market in any way. In fact, it actually inspired people to buy more comics. Yeah, like digital, if like if anything, greatly helped help retail stores. Yeah, I mean, I, I do my fair share of uh, digital reading, but mm -hmm. I mean, if I love something, I'm definitely going to go chase down the print version of it as well. Maybe get yourself a nice hardcover. Uh, <laughs> I still got a stack of spider women's I still need to come down and buy from you. Yeah. Well, who knows when you'll be able to do that. Yeah, I know, right? It's like, I want my spider woman covers. <laughs> so, uh, Tom McFarland's also talked about the fact that this would probably be a good opportunity for a lot of the companies to think about crossovers. Um, and, of course, my thought is, yeah, I mean, that, that would definitely bring in uh, the, the buyers. And uh, Gideon, you had some thoughts yeah. about eventitis. It it, uh, it feels a little bit like this big problem that we the comic industry has been in for the past twenty years, which is doing big splashy event thing 
like, say, killing off Captain America or uh, rebooting your entire universe. And a lot of people show up for that one issue and then they don't come back for seconds. Yeah, and a lot of casual fans may not know this, but the comic industry, by and large, does hedge a lot of its bets on the big summer event. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, the um, the last one uh, was being Hawks and Pox. Um, the new big summer event is this thing uh, where I guess the the Kree and the Skrull have joined forces against the the uh, the oppressors of Earth in Empire. Yeah, united by uh, by Hulkling, who is half Kree and half Skrull, and not only that, but half Kree royalty and half Skrull royalty. Yeah, he's Captain Marvel's son. Yep. And that uh, the the Kree princess that he fell in love with. Mm-hmm. Or Skrull so, princess. Oh, that's right. The Skrull princess. Uh, I forget what her name is. Jarell or something like that. Anyway. Jarell, Jarell would raise a lot of questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's what's going on. We're wondering if Empire is really going to uh, go over, you know? Like, it's got a good creative team behind it, but I'm just not super excited for it even even before the world shut down i was like eh, i might see what al ewing's doing with it maybe pick up one or two times that are interrupting books that i'm already reading like black panther age of wakanda but yeah just you really MS, can't it's, top, man, it's real yeah you can't top secret invasion for scroll nuttiness you can't do better scrolls than secret invasion yeah. um as much as i like crees crees are cool because i mean i love me uh, my Carol Danvers, and I definitely loved uh, all the different versions of Captain Marvel, as you can see. Ooh, Janice. <laughs> yes, one of my favorites. I love Peter David's run on that. Uh, I, I've also got, like, good old Captain Marvel over my shoulder here, my my, my shelving full of statues. Um, anybody that's going to put on the old uh, red, blue, and yellows, I'm definitely all about. Um so yeah, I'm all about the Kree, but I just I'm like you. I'm not really hyped up about Empire. Yeah. You know, nothing about it has really gone ooh to me. Ever yet. ever since I stopped buying events monthly, I've been much happier for it. Yeah. <laughs> I always I, I trade weight events. Okay, so that being said, um, we're finally gonna see, I guess, a <laughs> a fulfillment of prophecy, if that uh, Gideon is uh, to properly term it. Um I these guys have been trying to get me to read Vision since we first started this show uh, late last year. And as much as I heard really good stuff about it, I just couldn't get around to it. I think the reason why is um, I didn't really have an opinion of Tom King, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and it was 12 issues. So, I mean, it's not like a light, a light afternoon. I sit through six issues um, because the way I read is not fast, you know, because I will read something of, Huh, did I lose the context of what I was reading? I should read that page again. So it takes a while. And 12 issues took all afternoon. I, I You destroyed my afternoon with this. <laughs> but here's I had a question. Was it worth it? I will, I will definitely tell you that as we get into Book Club Edition Vision. <laughs> <laughs> 1 through 12, Tom King. Now, the more I read this, and I didn't put two and two together. The more I read this, the more I saw WandaVision in it. Yeah, you know I mean. this is heavily, heavily influencing WandaVision. And while I was, when I heard about WandaVision, I didn't put two and two together. You know, because Wanda wasn't really a big part of this whole thing until that. And of course, I'm talking about this one subject that we're jumping right to in the middle. But we're going we're gonna to get sequential with this. Um, but I didn't put two and two together until I read it. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, wow. So that makes sense. And that makes sense. And the picture of the, the kid's crib in WandaVision promotional things make sense. And damn, this might get dark. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, going into this, this book is dark. Um, it almost in is in its own genre of that. That that weird, creepy, underlying horror of suburbia. Stepford robots. Exactly. You know, the, the whole idea, do you know your neighbors? You know, that, that new genre that has been introduced. Uh, that they familiarly uh, uh, satirized in the burbs of Tom Hanks. Yeah. I uh, What sold me on this book was uh, the, that opening sequence where their neighbors, George and Nora, come to meet them for the first time. 
Someone had posted it on Reddit the day of release after I'd gotten home from work and was like, I don't like the vision. He's my least favorite Avenger. Boring dude wearing a banana peel. And (laughs) but then I read those panties and I was like, damn, this is really good. And I really liked Tom King's work on Omega Men and on Grayson. And I was really I remember I was really disappointed when it was announced. He was on the book. I was like, "Ah, I don't care about the vision. But damn, that first issue just. Knocks the wind right out of you. Yeah, within the first three pages, you get um, like the foreshadowing of what you're going to see in practically issue 10 or 9, 9 or 10. Um, the, uh, the line, they will die in flames. They will die in flames because one of the visions has set fire to their house. And then it, it details what their last thoughts are, uh, which, you know, uh, of course, the husband being melancholy about his, his wife's marriage and then his wife was just thinking about the really odd thing that she saw in Vision's a house and how could it possibly exist? Yeah, um, the Zenla water. The Zenla you know, water. So cool. Yeah, so I mean, there right then there, the right then there, you get the hook that this is going to go really bad for everyone. You know? Mm-hmm. And I was like, ah. Because I knew how the outcome because you told me. And of course, you know, the, I read Marvel comics and they talk about that, that yeah. this person is going to go away, and this person is going to go away, and this person is going to become this and champions. I was like, okay, so I know the outcome. How is it going to happen? Because I'd seen what happened to Victor Mancha in Runaways. It's like, why is he just ahead? <laughs> He's had a rough time. Yeah. Oh, boy. And we, we will get to the Victor sequences. Yeah. So let's start off. So um, Vision well, wants want... to make... Go ahead. Yeah. I was like, I, was like, I actually... Took, I took some notes when I did a little rereading earlier today. Kind of, you know, I'm gonna let you tackle this two. because you know this book so okay. intimately well, and I've just have been exposed to it once, and it was 12 issues ago. So you take it. Yeah. So the first issue does a great job of establishing everyone, like what what kind of their place in the family they're in. And for me, some of the best stuff on the first issue is uh, Vin Vincent, the son. There's a sequence of him at school. There's a great page where the girl behind him in class like passes him a note that says, are you normal? And it just kind of sticks with him. And he phases through the floor. Oh, it's a great scene. And uh, everything comes to a head at the end of the issue when Virginia and Vivian are attacked by the Grim Reaper, who is Wonder Man's brother, who the Vision's brain patterns are based off of. Wonder Man, then. Grim Reaper. Yeah, of course, Grim Reaper is coming in. And I was like, man, why is Grim Reaper going to mess with these people? Because Grim Reaper has a severe hang up about vision and how yeah. he was made and how he's created. So, I mean, he busts into his family's house with, you know, you're not normal. You're all abominations for all intents and purposes. And with his and, adamantium bladed arm. Right. Or, vibranium, not even adamantium. And so you know, everything seems like it's going to be contained because we're just dealing with a C-list villain here. It's not going to be a big deal. I mean, for me, I thought it was just, okay, this is going to be the villain action scene of the comic. But no, it sets the tone for the entire series. Yeah. The outcome and of this series, this situation. Yeah. The, the just absolutely creepy way that Virginia dispatches him after, after Vivian is just ba- essentially bisected. Like, she... she just yeah, she, she got um, she got impaled. Uh, yeah, she didn't get cut in half, but she got impaled, and she got uh, basically stuck in a in a loop of uh, seeing her her mother uh, over and over. Yeah, mommy, and mommy, mommy. Repetition is a big recurring motif in the book, and it's in a lot of Tom King's work as well. I know a lot of people clown on the bat, cat, bat, cat sequences in Batman, but in Vision, it's really haunting because. Again, like they're robot characters, so occasionally they will kind of glitch and get stuck in a loop. And you, it happens almost once an issue. Like, I, I, there might be a couple issues where it doesn't happen, but everyone in the family at least has one moment where they are under incredible duress and they start just looping the last lines of their sentences. Yeah. Now, now since I, I did the entire 12 issues in one sitting, mm-hmm. it's all just become one big story one big piece. for me. Yeah, so I'm going to have to rely on you to kind of break up which parts happen yeah. in which issues so I can give my proper thoughts on this. So help me, Gideon. Add in, is, framework. in issue two, uh, Vin is having more trouble at school. 
particularly like he gets in a fight with a kid and really messes him up because he's got phasing powers. Yeah, he finds that, that, that cluster of nerves right here that uh, he goes into long detail is, is there for a reason so that their, your head does not become overflowed with blood and causing strokes. It's this it's here to regulate that. And if you just apply a little bit of pressure, cuts off the blood to your hand. If you do it too long, it kills somebody. And so, of course, the visions get called in by the principal to be like, hey, control your dang kids. They're scaring people with their weird robotness. And Vision gives this amazing speech about how uh, I, he, I'm a member of the Avengers. I have saved the world 37 times. Every day you live, you have me to thank. <laughs> oh, it's such a good I, I, I'm not saying that I'm telling you what to do, but I am telling you the state of things. Yeah. I will probably go. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, basically it, telling him that he, if he pushes his luck, that just vision being vision, it'll go his way. Yeah. Like there's, that's one of the things I found really interesting about the book is that it allows vision to be this incredibly, I don't want to say morally dubious character, but certainly like a much more nuanced version than I've seen him be before, where he's, much more willing to go farther for his goals. Much more self-aware of yes. who he is in the world. Yeah. Yeah. He is he is not just the Avengers Roomba. He is a <laughs> genuinely intimidating guy who wants to protect his family at any cost. Yeah. And that, uh, unfortunately for better or for worse, Virginia is also <laughs> Will, willing to do anything to protect her family. Very much so. You know, you know this, this, um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit because we're talking about this, but, but the series did introduce me something that I didn't realize, but the more I thought about it, it made complete sense, which is the idea of robot logic and how uh, P versus NP. Uh, P being um, this, that, this can happen, this can happen, this can happen, it'll have this outcome. This is, in my data analysis, this could possibly happen. Or, you're presented with a scenario that you did not calculate towards, but when you think about it, it's acceptable in its existence. Therefore, I don't, it's, it's the equivalent of saying I have the answer, but I don't have the work to show for it. But it still looks like an acceptable answer. But have you ever tried forcing yourself to come up with the work to get that impossible answer? And that's where uh, logic bombs can happen. Yeah, and and that's all. That's uh, that becomes a theme for some of the later issues. And the, the more I thought about, it, I was like, that's that's deep. That's exceedingly deep. <laughs> uh, I I never really thought about that. But and the more I thought about, it, I was like, well, I mean, it's, it's logic, and logic is so interesting. I, I I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but um, I I want your interpretation of P versus NP when we get to that point. And there's a, uh, of course. Vivian gets repaired, but obviously with severe psychological trauma from this whole, from the, the whole being murdered thing. Yeah. And, um, and yeah. She, carry, she carries that way with her for the rest of the series. And this is by no means the last trauma that will happen to Vivian in this book, oh unfortunately. She goes through so much in this series. And we will get to it at the end of why I'm very frustrated with how she's been portrayed afterwards. Yeah, now see, I actually see what you're talking about now. Yeah, it's it's why I couldn't read Champions. It's just I didn't like I did not like the direction they took Vivian, considering the context of where she came from. Because this series is her first appearance. Like the visions did not exist before this book. Now, now you understand my personal problems with other writers taking characters and completely throwing away their character development with Mystique and Sabretooth, both of them oh, drastically yeah. different in their new <laughs> interpretations. The the biggest thing to me though that's crazy is though that this was such a big critical darling and like frankly probably the best thing Vision's ever been in like no shade on Kree Scroll War or those original Ultron sagas but or our Vision and the Scarlet Witch which introduced the entire child thing in the eighties yeah exactly but it's just so weird to take a book that's such a spotlight on it and then to take a character from there and just completely ignore what led her to become that character. Yeah, what really bugged me about that is the fact that she she investigated or or she looked into the possibility of romantic connections in her head. Yet when the, she got the champion, she's talking to them like I've never kissed anybody, and 
all this other thing. I'm, I'm a blank slate to Bula Rasa and all that nonsense. I'm like, yeah, just Vivian is such an interesting, varied character in this book. And then she gets written as a one note robot in every other series she appears in. Yeah, she's basically Data. I mean, it's yeah. like they, they, a, they a hard drive well, wiped her. So, yeah, a less well written Data. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, it's it's frustrating going back and actually seeing how she developed over 12 issues in the series. Yeah. Champions, basically just, like you said, a, a, a one gag. Just yeah. one gag, yeah. So, I don't understand humanity, therefore I'm going to do this with thing. Yeah. So what we start getting as we move along more into the middle section of the book is someone is blackmailing Virginia with video of her burying Grim Reaper's body. Yeah, and they send her a, a cell phone saying, hey, uh, here's the code, unlock this. And then you see her with the video of her bearing uh, Reaper in the backyard. And it's like, you know, if you care about what's going on here, you need to come here yeah. to and this address. The blackmailer turns out to be the father of a boy Vivian knows at school. And the same boy that the son had yeah. <laughs> basically all, injured and turned off. <laughs> all comes together. And... Yeah. Uh, Virginia panics, and it doesn't end well for them. They both are killed. <laughs> and so the pile yeah. of bodies to maintain this appearance of normalcy with the visions just builds up, and the pressure is building on Vision himself. And just, ah. And of course, uh, no, so, what's the guy's name? CK or something like that? The, the uh, kid's name is CK. The kid's, name is, the kid's name is Chris, and his last name starts with a K. Yeah, they call, they call him CK. Okay, so CK had previously gone to, to Viv and basically told her that he thought that she was cool. And they're like walking around in the rain and like talking you know, deeply about things around them. And, and she's just focusing on the fact that, you know, he just he, he's just regarding her as a girl and that, that she thinks he thinks she's cool. And I like that one cool thing is like, oh, um, aren't you going to get wet? She goes, oh, no, the rain's just falling through me. It's like that's yeah. cool. They this book does a great job of using Vision's phasing powers and making them visually interesting. Like kudos to Gabriel Walta. He crafts some incredible visuals in this book. They're still just so haunting. So I, Walt, I can't praise his work enough in this series. It, it really is good. Now going back to that scene you're talking about where the, the father is confronting uh Mrs. Vision. Um uh, uh, I'm forgetting Virginia. Her name. Virginia, thank you. They all they all um, have VI names. They all yeah. So she goes towards him and he says, hey, I've got a gun. I'm taking this seriously. You know, uh, I'm just letting you know that this is this is what's, what's going on. I brought you to my home to face you like a man, but I'm going to protect my own. But when she goes to him, he pulls out his gun, and he fires. She faces. And of course, the bullets go through her and into her, his son's head and chest. Yeah. Killing him instantly. And of course, yeah. Haunting stuff. It just, was, it's, it's, it's like, wow, this, it just keeps getting darker and darker. And this, this goes back to theme, you know, of the, of the dark suburban mystery. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, this is, this is not going to turn out well for anyone. And it, it, it really doesn't. No. It and, really uh, doesn't. <laughs> and this is also around the same time they really start developing Vin's insecurities about him being different with, uh, passages from William Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, like, you know, the whole do you prick my skin, do I bleed, all those amazing monologues. And that kind of just becomes a motif for the back half of the story. And that really zeroes in on Vin as a character. And it just makes where he winds up even more tragic. Uh, there, there is a, a small bit of humor when they're talking to Vin. He goes, listen, I know what you do when you go upstairs by yourself. We have all do it. There's no need to be embarrassed by it. You know, alluding to the fact that you know, he's going upstairs to masturbate, when in fact he's going up just to quote the Merchant of Venice to himself over and over. <laughs> there's a great, there's, there's a line that I really like where uh, Victor Mancha is like, hey, we know you like Shakespeare. It's really cool. But, uh, you know, maybe have other stuff. Don't make that your one interest. <laughs> like try out <laughs> other other human things. And that, that, that does bring us uh, really uh, easily into the next uh, act of it, the group, the act three, I guess I would put it, is uh, Uncle Victor showing up to Ooh. stay for the winter. Actually, before we get to that, sorry, I okay. shouldn't have introduced that idea before. Okay. Uh, there's another 
a very important member of the Vision family gets introduced to the midway point, and that is Sparky the dog. Oh, that who dog. is yeah, in one of the darkest sequences of the book. <laughs> That's their, neighbor's, the space. their neighbor's dog digs up Reaper's body, bites down on the scythe, and is electrocuted, killed instantly. And Vision, in a super creepy moment, is just like, oh. And he takes the dog down to his basement and rewires a robot dog around its brain. Yeah, he basically, you know, brains the dog, skulls it, takes the dog's brain. I was like, where's he going? Oh, I know where he's going with this. And then next thing you know, you've got this big green dog. I got us a dog. I got us a dog with our abilities. It's and yeah. I'm like, they, <laughs> see, I remember when the book was coming out, they had a little contest in the letters column to name the dog because he's not named Sparky. I don't think until the final issue, he's just kind of around as a dog. Yeah. And I remember at the time being very disappointed that he did not also have a V name. <laughs> but I oh, guess yeah. I guess when you have Virginia, Vincent, and Vivian, you're starting to the pickings get a little slim. Now that, that makes sense why Victor is Victor. Yeah, and Victor. Yeah. So going thing Uncle Victor is showing up. Victor Macho, which is the son of Ultron. Mm-hmm. Uh okay. therefore also uh basically Vision's brother, and hence Uncle Victor. Yep. So Uncle Victor uh is coming to visit. He's gonna stay for the summer and it shows him interacting with all the different uh family members and everyone likes him, especially the son uh Vin. Um however, however just, just when you've really, really endeared yourself to this idea of a human element, because you do actually see Victor's thought processes as he does this. And Victor is and much more acclimated to like, being human. the human world than, yeah, they are. And it seems like his introduction is helping them also make this, acclim- uh, this, this, this introduction, because he doesn't feel that they're alien, because they're like him. They're just not to where he is right now. So, I mean, he's like the perfect crutch for them getting over this. Uh, but then... Then walks in on him, and it turns out that Victor is a plant by the Avengers. Who are like, uh, hey, Vision's doing some weird shit out in the suburbs. Can you check that out? Yeah, because uh, Agatha Harkness has come to uh, them, and she, it, it almost in one sentence, uh, tells you just how dangerous this situation is slowly becoming. Um, because I, I think this goes back to the P versus NP argument uh but vision is, is quickly getting to the point where maintaining his family is paramount to everything and if that becomes the case he'll be capable of some great horror and 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 uh he could very well burn the earth is a metaphor yeah there's also a a, a little segue issue around this time that's vitally important because while at first it's kind of just a little retrospective, feels almost like a catch up of like, hey, here's what Vision of Scarlet Witch's deal is. That ends on the reveal that the patterns for Virginia, and I mean, it's not, it's kind of a little predictable. I mean, like, who else would he base Virginia on? But exactly. yeah, it is. She is, in fact, based on his ex wife, the Scarlet Witch. Well, who he did with her permission. Yes. As um, a, a and, key point, note to point, because that's much, much better to have done it with permission. It would have been and, 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 the, and the thing that really kind of uh, startled me is that all those flashbacks that we're seeing with their relationship are not coming from Vision's perspective, but Virginia's perspective as she digs deeper into her own mind. Yeah. God, and that's like, good too. Wow. <laughs> There's a guest artist on there. I'm trying to remember who it was. Give me one second to. Oh, you got to dig that one out. Hold on. I found the issue really quick. I I, se- I severely think that um, those those ex those, those memories that she digs out corners of her mind were truly the death knell of that character. Michael Walsh. Michael Walsh was the artist for number seven. Oh, I don't know why Michael Walsh. Oh, he does great work in this issue. Fair enough. Who did the art in this issue or this uh, book? 
Uh, Gabriel Walta is the primary artist for issues one through six and eight through twelve. Issue seven is done by Michael Walsh. What has he done before? Gabriel Walta, he did Colin Bunn's Magneto book a few years back. It was really good. He did uh, Occupy Avengers, which is really fun. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm trying to remember what else. He's he's a pretty prolific artist. He's done a lot of stuff the last five or six years. So, uh, getting to the end of this, as Vin discovers Victor has become a plant because he walks into him basically talking to the Avengers, saying, Yes, I've gotten in deep with them. I've gotten their trust. I'm like, oh my God, they'll tip the trail. The worst possible time to walk the in. The worst possible time to walk in. And, you know, Victor panics because he doesn't know what to do. And he just wants to explain himself. But he, his inerrant ma- magnetic abilities are basically savaging Vin's system as he holds him in place. And all Vin wants to do is get home. And Vin goes, no, you need to, ex- I need to, wa- I need to explain myself. You need, I need to explain myself. And he basically just hits him way too hard with his abilities and just wipes him. And then basically becomes, for all intents and purposes, dead. Yeah. And the the issue after it is one of my favorite ones. There's this, the family mourning then is just heartbreaking. There's yeah, the praying scene. Yeah, that was the one I was thinking of. Yeah. There's, there's a scene where Vivian and Vision pray together and they're both kind of like, well, I don't like we don't really believe in God, but it feels good to pray still. It it fills something within them. Right. They're not praying to God, but what they're doing is asking. They're praying that there is a God. Yeah. They're praying that if there is a God, that Vin's soul is at rest. And 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 they're basically praying for things that they know for right now that their logic tells them doesn't really exist but that they wish to but they wish and And that's what they're praying is becoming it's such a sweet scene i love it love it love it it's a highlight of the book for me i enjoyed it too actually um you know (laughs) it was surprisingly touching i was i was expecting this book to be really excessive with its use of logic because these are androids yeah but then we have to really I had to keep reminding myself that they're not really robots. They're synthetic humans and they will adapt as such if you give them time. So watching them kind of sort out the unknowns of the universe, uh, coupled with their own fears of reality and has come to this, they think she, she does this, this, uh, spontaneous action of coping. Yeah. I thought was really cool. Um, yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that was actually pretty stirring. Um, I'm really glad that her as a character is still around. And I really wish that we could see that more of this of Vivian. Yeah. Um, another particularly dark scene that really messed with me is when Vivian decided to visit CK's grave. Oh, and she phases through it. And she goes, I should not have seen that. Oh, cause yeah. it's very clear. Cause you see the grave and you see her rising out of it knowing full well that she has gone down there to see his body. And, you know, she sits down and says, I I should not have seen that. It's, yeah, really haunting. The the final act of this book, it's it's a lot of fight sequences, but they're really well done fight sequences because it's just vision on a rampage of revenge against the Avengers and just bodying them. And the whole time it's contrasted with quotes and panels from his first couple appearances where he is fighting the Avengers. Really well done. And you find out you find out that Virginia has been subtly altering uh, his personality to accept certain facts. um, First, uh, facts that would cover her uh, during this, 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 the murder of uh, the Grim Reaper and the accidental killing of CK. But she also manifests uh, certain parts of his personality and pushes them further than they need to be, which is where all his major aggression is. He yeah. basically shows up and says, you know, he sees the Avengers and Spider-Man and, of course, the Inhumans, because Marvel was really trying to shoehorn the, in- the Inhumans into <laughs> everything in 2016. Um, and he goes, I'm here to kill Victor Mancha. I welcome your help, but I do not require it. <laughs> and he keeps saying this over and over. So good. <laughs> 
I, I am here to kill him. You may help, but I do not require it. <laughs> and, and then, yeah. and then while all that is going on, Virginia slides in, adds one more to her body count. Not her last, but no, no, not she, her avenges, last. she avenges her son and kills Victor. Basically, uh, freeing vision of of being put into a cell for the rest of his existence, yeah. uh, taking away what he would have easily done, but then he would have only done it because of her mechanization. So she's really the architect of of uh, Act Three, as far as I uh, understand. Um, and you know, and that's the one of the crazy things about this book. Well, not really crazy. One of the great things about it is you get it, like you understand why Virginia does what she does throughout the entire series. It's because she just wants to protect her family. And that's true of the woman she's based on, Scarlet Witch. Like, as much as Scarlet Witch kind of gets classified as like, oh, she's power crazy and women can't handle all these powers. It's like, no, there's like a very clear line of why she did the same things she does, even all the way up to No More Mutants. Yeah, um, but apparently this also goes the extra mile because when... Vision goes home. She decides to off herself. Yeah, and she, and, she, but not before completely, like setting the record straight. Like I did all of this. None of this was Vision's doing. Like she calls the cops while she is killing herself with the water from Zen La. Yeah, she's ingesting it, and it has this corrosive quality. And he's like, well, you know, just phase out and it will drop out of you. And she goes, I'm, I don't, I don't want to do that. And this goes back to the, the repetition thing that you were talking about, because at this point, she's so traumatized that she's doing the repeating every like fourth or fifth word. She's repeating it three times or twice. And it's clear that she's on her way to a complete breakdown. And as she's dying, she gets a pseudo eulogy from Scarlet Witch, who is talking with Vivian. And she ends on the line, she saved what she could, which I thought was really powerful and encapsulated her entire arc. Because that was all she was essentially doing throughout the series was putting out fires, but not essentially realizing that she was making them worse. And that dis- I hope that despite her actions that you love her. Yes. And this is this final issue is possibly my favorite, just because... It's Vivian's arc is realized that she's not going to let all of these actions define her. She is. Let me see. I'm trying to find the exact quote. I let me just flip it up. Let me just read to it. Give me a sure. second. Yeah, there's a, a lot of things about the story. I mean, obviously, we've got 12 issues to grind through, and there's a lot of things we've had to kind of skip or gloss over just because yeah. the, the ex- exposition on it would require a lot of time, like the one gor- the one guardian um, plants, that whole process, Agatha Harkness, uh, the fate of the dog. Oh, there's so yeah, many other my, things going on here. My biggest hope for this is not to just take the story as check marks of events, but just the, the sheer craft in it brought by the entire creative team. It's It's an experience. You really do have to read it. So please, please go buy a copy of this book after you watch this episode, if you haven't already seen it. Uh, I have, I've never decried this particular series, but like you, not a Vision fan. And I was certainly very reluctant to do a 12-issue dig on a character that I only have a passing interest in. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, his best version was when he was all white with the West Coast Avengers. Um, but yeah, this uh, good book is a classic. Yeah. The, the sequence that I was looking for, uh, Vision asks if, like, Vivian wants to feel more normal and, like, blend in with the other kids at school after he offers her a lunch. And she responds with, two months ago, my uncle killed my brother. In response, my mother killed my uncle, then killed herself. And now I'm a teenage synthesoid being raised by an Avenger. I'm not normal, father. But I am late and I must go. Goodbye. And it's just, I love that she comes out of this a positive character. Like, right. She has like she does she has the option to shut off entirely and be like a white vision like back in the 80s and not feel anything, but she's choosing to grow from these experiences. And I think that's a really powerful life affirming message. And that was something that vision is is 
And he has a, a pattern of doing, which is when the, the shit gets too thick, he starts over. Yeah. And that's why I'm very frustrated. So after this great, t- phenomenal 12-issue series, Vivian shows up a couple months later in the first issue of Champions, where she does exactly what I didn't want them to do. And she just says, I had a very traumatic teenage experience, and now I'm completely shut off from my emotions. Beep boop. What is kissing? What are boys? I'm just yeah. A I've robot. lost my son. I've lost my brother and my mother, and I no longer have those emotional connections, but they are damaging. It's, yes, it's so frustrating. It is completely antithetical to the message of the book, and it's which one do you think is going to be more read in twenty years, guys? Vision or Champions? And you know, as much as I love champions, I love the idea of uh, teen heroes. Uh, champions did not hold my interest very long. Yeah, I, I wanted, checked I out to right like after. It. I checked out right after the Atlantean storyline. I I, like, eh. I bounced after issue one because I was so mad about his treatment of Vivian. Yeah, see, I, I probably would have been irritated by because you know, I I'm not big thrill about that kind of crap happening. They did it to. Uh, Mystique after her uh, series, which was also around there in uh, 2016, I believe. No, wait, I'm sorry. This was way, yeah. way further yeah, than that. That was a Brian K. Vaughn fact. Yeah. Tsunami thing. Uh, I'm, I'm getting that mixed up because Mystique came out the same time as uh, Runaways, which we're going to talk about here at the very end of this episode. Um, she came out as part of the whole Tsunami thing, and then she had 24 issues of character defining uh, greatness, and then just Boom, goes into a B-grade one-note villain as soon as she appears outside of it. Yeah, that is the biggest downside of a continu- continuing comic universe is status quo is God. We get a couple of blips every now and then and changes, but frustratingly enough, Saber is always going to go back to just the guy that fights Wolverine. And Not Mystique's always going to be that. some conniving betrayer. Yeah. And and Doc Ock is always going to go back to a misshapen scientist with uh, arms coming out of his side and a stupid jumpsuit. Never forgive. So upset about that. I'm still upset about that. But you know I what? I love Superior Spider-Man. Let's, let's focus on what's important. This book's amazing. It it's is really amazing. One of the best things Marvel has done in the past 10 years, maybe even in the past 20 years. It, it, it clearly it still holds up because I just reread it after four years and... Still damn good. And, and I bet you this was a, a hell of an elevator pitch. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, OK, you want to do what with Vision? And he wants to do it over 12 issues. I one mean, of the he had of, to pitch the shit out. Oh, of man. One but, of the really fun things about the hardcover is it comes with a bunch of production art. I don't know if it comes with his initial pitch or not, but it comes with like a lot of behind the, like behind the scenes. Uh, like notes and stuff, character, things that he was developing. It's really, really good little package. And it's pretty cheap, 40 bucks for 12 issues. And half of that is bonus content. Huh. I miss the days when trade paperbacks are 25 bucks. <laughs> oh, this is a nice days. oversized hardcover, though. I think the paperback that has the same content is only $30. So that's not so bad. Yeah. $40 is a good price for 12 issues and a hardback with extra time. For, yeah. I, I, I for a really nice that. presentation. That's yeah. great. So, so um, you were right to get me in on this, and it only took uh, a worldwide pandemic and two episodes deep into it for me to actually read this damn thing. Uh, but I'm glad I did. Uh, I'm really glad I had an opportunity to read this. Um, I, it, it, it really did. As deep and great as it is, it made me sad on a lot of levels. Uh, just because it, it, it does, not only does it talk about the idea of, of, of being human and, and suffering the slings of arrows of humanity while also being on the outside, but also deals with, uh, with the interpretation of loss on an almost an alien viewpoint. Yeah. You I've know? been uh, rewatching Star Trek The Next Generation lately. And I am a huge, huge data fan, so a lot of those feelings have been washing over me all over again. Oh <laughs> god, yes. robot boys. And especially with the end of Picard, which we won't get into. Ah, don't, I still haven't seen it. <laughs> Watch. We're <laughs> say I, I'm like seven episodes out from finishing Next Gen, and then we're gonna do that CBS. We gotta, we gotta do Picard, man. And, 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 and then I'll get you into Star Trek Online, and then my plan will be complete. 
Ah, <laughs> uh, so that was not doing say, hands. I was moisturizing. <laughs> uh, I guess just to let y'all know, our next uh, book we'll be doing for book club is one switching things up from this week, where we did a book that I had read and Casey had not. We're doing a book that Casey has read and I have not, and that is the first twelve issues of Brian K. Vaughn and Adrian Alfona's Runaways. I, I adore this series. Now, this, granted, this is the first twelve issues. Yeah. Uh, but the series ran to eighteen. So if I can convince you to go the extra mile, I'll, I'll probably check them out on Marvel Unlimited. But I've, okay. got, I've had this big hardcover of the first 12 for years and just haven't got around to reading it. And so I was like, well, you know, with end of the world coming and needing some material for a podcast, why not? Yeah, it? very much so. And I know I understand 18 issues is a lot to ask. I mean, I balked at 12, so I can understand that. There's so much going on in those last six issues that are just awesome as hell. Well, but, hope, let's say hopefully I'm grabbed enough that I will be compelled to finish it. We'll see. Yeah, we'll, we'll, you know what? We'll talk after 12 and see if we want to go the extra six. Let's do it that way. Yeah. All and right. uh, with that, Casey, I'll let you take us away. Uh, indeed. Um, we're still trying to stay as active as possible in this new world that we find ourselves in. Uh, we're not in the studio. Um, we don't have the comics to review, um, but we will talk about all the news that we can possibly grab that comes with top, uh, comics media. And we'll talk about uh, cool comics that we love and even some of the ones that managed to squeak through the production uh, process. We're definitely going to look into those and we'll probably look at Empire and hope to God it doesn't suck. Um, check us out on our other uh, things. We've got a Patreon site uh, for all of our extra content. Uh, we're still on the uh, uh, the Instagram. We've got, we're doing it for the gram. Uh, I believe we're also on Twitter. And, of course, we're on our YouTube show here. And you can also catch uh, my personal project at uh, Facebook.com, My Comic Book Facts, uh, wherein I try to talk about um, comic book backgrounds, about characters you may have seen in uh, popular media, like uh, movies and TV shows. So check us out, uh, give us some feedback down below, and we'll see you next week here at uh, <laughs> as we, as we, as we uh, See you next week, guys.